right, welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and Afaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV. Abe, we've reached the, reached the final leg of a very, very long and trying weekend. Kudos to you, sir. You're a, you're a hero in my eyes. Thank you, sir. We have on the couch. It's one day got to be in the Hall of Fame, bro. You deserve it. Downtown Bruno, Harvey Whippleman, sir. Thank you for joining the broadcast. How are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, doing the show here. Ah, with well, you. we're looking forward to having you. We were talking earlier uh, on the channel. We have numerous shows with numerous podcasters. This being the lead show. Um, but you were on our friends and family, uh, Dan and Benny, in a ring a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they were very happy with the interview. Um, I listened to it. It was fantastic. You're well, quite the you. talker, so I'm looking forward to, ha to having a few discussions here. Let's do it to it, Sonny Pruitt. Well, you were at the big event in New York. Yeah, sure What was. were your thoughts of the event? Oh, you know what? It was great. I was with uh, at the table with... Uh, uh, one of my dearest friends, Brooklyn Brawler, Steve Lombardi, and also uh, uh, joining us was La Resistance, uh, Rob Conway, uh, Sylvain uh, Grunier, and uh, Rene Dupree, great guys. And we were brought in by uh, Bobby Rydell and Joe Matthews, two other great guys. So, I mean, I really enjoyed uh, re reuniting with people that I enjoy being around and uh, interacting with the fans, meeting some fans, and, uh, you know, and uh, – the fellowship and the atmosphere, it's, it's, it was really good. I always enjoy those uh, events and meeting everyone. And, uh, you know, anytime I get an opportunity to, to uh, be at one of them, I, you know, if somebody calls me to come, I normally go. How does it make you feel at, like, today's wrestling fan? It's been a while, right, that still love and adore you and they want your autograph and picture with you. Like, uh, what kind of feeling does that give you? Well, it makes me feel good because, you know, I've been doing this for 44 years. I started in 1944. Yeah, 1979. Um and I, other than a few sporadic appearances here and there as a special referee or special guest manager or something, uh, I hadn't really been, when I say in the ring or at ringside or whatever, on a full-time basis for over 25 years. But, you know, that means a lot to me. And uh, more so than like up here in New York or whatever, at home, which is a lot of people might not know or they might know, Memphis area is my home. And... You know, my phrase in Memphis for years that put me on the map was, it's like mama says, it bees that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm still, I'll be in the store, the Kroger's or the Walmart or just wherever, restaurant, and somebody will walk up to me and say, hey, downtown Bruno, mama says it bees that way. So that makes me feel good that it, I made an impression on people that much that I hadn't been on TV in like, you know, what, 25, 30 years. It's but been I a still bit. remember that. It's and been a bit. So it, uh. Now, that means a lot to me, you know, because I'm going to tell you, a lot of people don't know this, uh, but I'm sure you do, being a wrestling, you know, person. Well, trust me, I don't know a lot. Well, Believe me, I'm, you're probably you're telling, uh, you're telling me the first time. I'm no wrestling expert, but go ahead. All right, well, I, I bet you know this, though. Uh, years ago, it was territories. It was regional, mm -hmm. you know, before, you know, the uh, WWF at the time, E now, you know, went national and then, you know, worldwide. So, years ago, the only – wrestling people saw was their regional wrestling before the advent of cable tv and obviously way before internet and online and whatnot so every part of the country had their own regional wrestling that's the only wrestling they saw you know so in the memphis area uh the only wrestling that people in within the i don't know the parameters but i'm saying 400 miles or whatever of the memphis area all you could see was CWA, which was Memphis Wrestling, which changed to USWA, but we just call it Memphis Wrestling. So it was the strongest television show in the entire Memphis uh, viewing uh, market, period. At that time, back in the 80s, the Memphis Wrestling, which is every Saturday morning, had higher ratings in the area than wherever the top shows were at the time, the Cosby Show, Roseanne, Cheers. Uh, you know, Hill Street Blues, whatever the shows were then. And and I can tell you, and I always say this to every podcast I do or every radio interview, TV interview I do, this is God's honest truth. And and I'm not putting myself over or patting myself on the back. It's the TV that was so strong. I know for that brief period of time when we had lightning in the bottle, I know 
what Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and George Clooney and those people go through on a worldwide level, you know, with the people stalking them and people just gathering around them, you know, and people say, oh, Bruno, you're just trying to, you know, blow smoke up your own butt. No, I'm not. But again, it ain't me. It was the TV was so strong. And they didn't see Ric Flair. They didn't see Hulk Hogan. They didn't see the Von Erichs. They didn't see whoever was, you know, the main guys, you know, to come along because it was just our area. Jerry the King Lawler, Superstar Bill Dundee, uh, Robert Fuller, Jimmy Golden, Coco Beware, Rocky Johnson, myself. Man. Anywhere I went, I was surrounded. And I, I mean, I couldn't go to a restaurant and just eat. I couldn't walk around the Mall of Memphis, which ain't even there no more. But back then, it was the main place everybody went. I couldn't even walk around there. It was too, I mean, they weren't trying to attack me or nothing, but it was, you know what I mean? It was just dangerous, you know. It, it was but too, on the good part of it, right, did you get, like, offered free food all the time, free drinks, free hotels, things like yeah, that? Yeah, sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. Um, but the funny thing is, yeah, I did get that happen sometimes. And you know what's funny? If people think you're broke, they won't give you nothing free. If they think you're rich, they want to give you free stuff. It don't – I don't get it. <laughs> you know, and I was very rich. Good. That's good. I've been a good living, you know, and still do. But I'm saying back then, you know, in the early 80s, I ain't going to – lie to you we weren't getting rich i was making a living but they because i was on tv every week they figure oh he's on tv he must be right. filthy rich well not necessarily the case you know but yeah but yeah everywhere i went it was i mean for that period of time i i know it's an overused expression but we had lightning in a bottle at that time you know it was just unreal wow. memphis memphis made me you know it made me is that, that's where you started in memphis right well, that's not where I started. That's my home area. That's where I got my break. You know, I had been in, uh, before I got my break by Jerry King Lawler, who I owe a hell of a lot to in this world. Um, but I was in Hawaii territory for uh, the Maivias. I had worked in Kansas City with uh, the NWA, the original NWA, you know, with Bob Goggler when he was the president of the NWA. So, uh, you know, I had, Done a, you know, I worked for Dale Mann in Mid-Continental out of Kentucky as well, in West Virginia, uh, I think Ohio too. But the main break I got, the best exposure and what set me, you know, on fire at that time was Memphis. So I owe everything. I mean, Memphis made me. Without Memphis, I wouldn't be sitting here today with you. Well, let, let me ask you a question, right? So on the show, once in a while, me and my partner used to do a thing called Head to Head, right? And we'd put two wrestlers together, and then we would judge them on, like, ring skills, mic skills, things like that. Right. You were in Memphis. You saw how popular Jerry Loyler was. Absolutely. Was – would it – tell me what your feelings are. Would you say Loyler – you would compare Loyler to a Bruno San Martino or a Hulk Hogan? Yeah, I mean, I don't know much about Bruno San Martino, so I can't. Right. I, I would, it wouldn't be fair for me to – discuss him but yeah Hulk Hogan sure Hogan himself will tell you that he learned a lot in Memphis from Jerry the King Lawler like when Lawler would uh, make his comeback he would pull the strap down and that was it you know and bam 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 boom it was time to go home well Hogan basically does the same thing instead of pulling the strap he does that Hulk up thing you know and he got the doing with the ear from Austin Idol who was a main guy in Memphis, babyface and heel, depending on the circumstance. So, uh, yeah, in Memphis, Lawler was absolutely like the Hogan. You know, I mean, honestly, when he would pull that strap down, that whole auditorium would come unglued. And it was great. I mean, I loved being in the ring with him. He was the best guy I ever worked with in the ring. I never had to worry about getting hurt. I never had to worry about having a bad match. You know, because I've wrestled him. I mean, wrestling wasn't my main thing. It was mostly managing and then later refereeing. But I wrestled quite a bit in Memphis, and I wrestled Lawler many a times. And uh, I always had a good match. And I'm not saying I was great in the ring. I'm very limited, and, I, and I'm the first to admit it. But I know how to work my my gimmick. I know what my limitations are. So, And we always had good matches. It was great. I, I mean, I can't say a negative word about his work in the ring, or especially his work with me, you know. How were you guys, because you guys did what, every, at the same arena every Monday night, right? Every Monday night was Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis. And you were you packed every Monday night? I mean, it wasn't sold out every Monday night. Sometimes it was. I mean, it was good houses during, you know, before 
naturally when things changed years later, you know, with, you know, as we discussed cable TV and whatnot. But yeah, it was, you know, very good houses most of the time. Memphis every Monday, Louisville Gardens every Tuesday, Evansville Coliseum every Wednesday, Thursday uh, spot show, Friday spot show, Saturday Memphis TV, Saturday morning live, Saturday night Nashville Fairgrounds Sports Arena. Sunday could either be Rupp Arena in Lexington, maybe Jackson, Tennessee, or maybe a spot show, or maybe an off day. But uh, we had good houses. Like I said, for the, the 80s were on fire. Now, towards the end of the 80s, when cable started, you know, becoming pre- prevalent and, you know, people could see other wrestling and you could sit home and watch it instead of come out, uh-huh. you know, naturally things started to, uh, I don't know if unravel is the right word, but, you know, just started to take their course, so. So at that point, were you were you thinking to yourself, mm, I might have to get out of Memphis and try to get into another organization where cable TV is more prevalent? I really wasn't because by that time, I was in charge of the rings. You know, I was a referee, but I was also I had my own crew to get the rings to you know put up and took down and, and transported from town to town. Um, now some of the places already had the ring, like the Louisville, Evansville, Nashville had the ring already there, so that I didn't have to deal with that. But Memphis and then any spot shows around Memphis, I had my own crew and TV, Memphis TV. So I was uh, satisfied just being a referee and putting and being in charge of the ring crews. I mean, I didn't have any idea, none of us did, you know, that just because business was down, that things were going to go away completely, you know, which it did. So it's funny you said I wasn't trying to go nowhere. And – uh, Howard Finkel called me back in, I'm the world's worst of years, I think it was 89, might have been 90 or whatever, to want to know was I interested in coming to work for WWE. Uh, of course, F at the time, we always say WWE now. Um, and I told Laura, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied here. You know, I've got a pretty secure position. I, I don't think I'm going to go. And he says, oh, really? WWE called you and you're going to stay here with Fat Raymond and Chili Willie and put the ring up and take it down? I said, well... I got a secure, a secure spot here. He goes, no, you don't. You're fired. So it, him firing me was, you know, what the best thing that ever happened to me. You know what I mean? Right. Because I was naive enough to think that things were going to last forever in Memphis. Well, obviously they didn't. And I would have been out of a job and out of the business at, at probably at that point. So now 44 years later, I'm pretty happy that he I'm, fired me. But stupid question, though. Like, ha, like Finkel's up north. You're in Memphis. How do you guys even know each other? Well, I never knew him. I never met him in my life. But Howard, who was a tremendous guy, God bless his soul, he was the walking encyclopedia of our profession, you know. And he was the one that would uh, know what was going on in each territory. You know, he would be able to tell, you know, Vince or whoever, uh, you, know, you know, we need a manager. Well, there's a guy in Memphis that's doing a great job, Bruno, whatever. Plus, Sid put a word in for me. He was up there several months before me. And I guess they were wanting a, another manager because at that time, they were damn near every heel had their own manager. And I guess, you know, my name got brought up. And I knew at that point I'd been in the business 10, 11 years already. So I guess a lot of people – and I always got along with everybody. I never had problems with – I could count on one hand the people I had problems with mm-hmm. over the years, which I don't even glorify them by bringing up their name. You know what I mean? Um, so everybody, oh yeah, Bruno, he's a good guy. He was always good to me when I came to Memphis. He was, you know, uh, so that's, you know, like whoever, I don't know who, but somebody said, Howard, get a hold of, of, uh, you know, Bruno Lauer, downtown Bruno, and, uh, see if he's interested in coming up, whoever told him that, you know, and it was funny because there was no cell phones back then. So I was living at that time in Jerry the King Lawler's guest house behind his house on Walnut Grove in East Memphis. But the day that Howard decided to call me, we were in Tell City, Indiana for a spot show. I had my ring crew up there and I was in the ticket booth. While they were putting the ring up, I, before Eddie Marlon would get there, I would sell tickets to advance people. So the, the phone rang in the ticket booth and it was Howard Finkel. And he says, oh, I'd like to speak to Bruno. So he found out where I was at somehow. He must have called the Jarrett's office or whatever. They said I was up there. Well, I thought it was one of the boys, you know, screwing with me, or whatever. So I just, I said, "Oh yeah, good for you, goodbye." Then he called back again. I mean, I didn't know if it was Tom Pritchard or Tony Anthony or who it was messing with me. I didn't really believe it was Howard Finkel from right. WWF. E. Um, so anyway, long story short, we got it worked out, and I went to 
Worcester, Massachusetts for my initial visit and meet with everyone. And I've been there ever, you know, got my deal. When that original phone call takes, though, are, are you like, I don't know, you, look, you've been in Memphis a long time. You have this loyalty to Loyola and Jarrett. Right. You're living in the guy's guest house. I right. mean, geez. Are you, like, excited that you could be going to W? I know you said that you said, hey, I'm secure here, whatever else. But what was the inner turmoil with you? Uh, obviously, I would assume the excitement to be able to come up to the WWE just to say you, for your career. Well, sure. Well, the thing is, yeah, I mean, obviously I did want to go, but I also knew I was secure in Memphis. And I was, I was afraid, what if I get up to up there and it, it don't work out? They don't like my work or they don't like my manager or, I, or, or whatever. You know, and uh, that's what Lawler t- said. Well, if they don't like it, I'll let you put in an application. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, but I went up there and everything, you know, they've been so made my life. You, you know? go up there. Correct. Again, to be fair, you know, big time, right? The major yeah, leagues, you, you're, you're home. Can you tell me the first time you meet Vince McMahon and what you will, what, what it was like? How did you feel? I felt very comfortable. He was most personable, friendly, as he knew who I was. Wait a right minute, away. but you weren't like, oh, my God, it's Vince McMahon. Well, I, inside, know. yeah, but I wasn't yeah. going to, you know, act like a goof. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to make sure I made a good impression. And, uh, no, he was very personable, very friendly, very professional. Shook my hand, knew who I was right away. Can you can you share a little bit about the conversation, though? Like, what, what was the interaction? Like, was he as big as life that you expected? I mean, what was it like? Oh, sure. He, uh, well, what happened was, he, you know, at – at TV, he always has his own little private office at the at the arenas, and uh, they said, "Okay, uh, Vince wants to meet with you now." They didn't say Mr. McMahon or what. Vince wants to meet meet with you now. So, uh, me and uh, Sid and Pat Patterson and Vince was in the room together, and Vince said, "Welcome aboard. Welcome. How are you? I, I, I'm familiar with you. This, that, and the other." And uh, Hogan had told him about me too, you know, and said, "Oh, he's been giving the king a hard time in Memphis for a lot of years. Good guy." And Hogan would treat me like gold too. So, no, Vince made me feel very comfortable, you know. I mean, yeah, you're intimidated a little bit by the most powerful man in our industry, don't get me wrong, but he wasn't an intimidating person, if you know what I mean. It wasn't like, okay, let me see. You know, like his character on TV. <laughs> well, did he give you a list of expectation, what he's expecting from you and no. what your role's going to be? No, he just told me to go out there and uh, in a dark interview with Gene Oakland just a dark in front of the audience just to see how I could interact with Oakland and with, the, you know, my talking and my, I guess my, you know, physical, you know, gesture or whatever, you know, he just wanted to see, he didn't want to see it back in the back. You know, he wanted to see it out there in front of the crowd. So me and Oakland did a uh, back and forth for like 10 minutes uh, in front of the crowd and uh, evidently Vince liked it. Okay. Cause I, you know, I'm just a fan, right? So I only know what I hear. I, right. I was asking, did, did Vince go, Come here for a second. Let's go over this. You could have done this. Or he was totally happy with what you did. Now, here's the funny thing. I don't know if you know this or not. You, maybe you're just uh, having – did you read this in the book? or is this... No, sir. I oh, okay, not. okay. I... I'm just a genius interviewer. That all right. Is all. Well, how about this? <laughs> when Vince said – all he told me when I went out there to do the thing with Oakland, all he said, he didn't give me no bullet points. He didn't give me any. Here's what I want. He says, show me what you can do. He goes, show me something I've never seen before. That's all he said. So went out there, and we, me and Gene briefly talked. We didn't go over anything, but we, we just kind of went with the, We were up in Massachusetts, and I'm from Mississippi. So we were going to work, since nobody knew me up there except hardcore fans that might have, you know, followed me on the, in the magazines or something. Nobody really knew me. So we were doing the angle where we're up here in Massachusetts. I'm Gene Oakland, and I'm. Well, I'm from Mississippi. We don't like you, Northern. You know, that type of thing. Just to somehow get the people against me, you know. So we're going back and forth. So Gene's playing right into it with me, doing a great job. Well, I have nothing against the great state of Mississippi, but except for one thing, I don't like you or, you know, something like that. Right, right. So I reached back and I slapped him, okay. That wasn't told for me to do or whatever. I just slapped him. And Gene looked at me and I looked at him, and then he was, I can't believe you did that, blah, blah, blah. We're going to. Okay. So we get in the back. And uh, Vince says, uh, interview was great. I didn't like the slap. I said, oh, boy, here we go. Let me call Lawler. I'm going back to put up the ring. So whatever. So I'm like dejected. And Gene came through the curtain or whatever, and Vince was telling me that. And Vince calls me to the side. He goes, 
can you come to Portland, Maine tomorrow night? I said, nice. yes, sir. He goes, do it again. He goes, but this time, slap him harder. <laughs> Great. Yes. So that's that was the only direction. So we did it again, and, and you know, that was that on that. So I'm <laughs> that's, that's how that went. Um, one fan asks, uh, any funny – uh, any funny stories with managing Kamala? Nothing really funny. I mean, you know, we we, we was, uh, main event with Undertaker all over the place and main event with Ultimate Warrior all over the place. So uh, nothing funny. It was, you know, it was matches were good with uh, Undertaker. And uh, let's just say the matches with Ultimate Warrior were uh, matches. They I were, got you. Yeah, but, you know, they... I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you down a different road since you know this is just purely a fan's question, but I think we should discuss it. Uh, it's pretty wide and within the wrestling industry that Kamala felt that he was taken advantage of as a wrestler, especially in those matches against Undertaker, pay wise. Untrue. You, I I, I want I just want you to share your thoughts. Yeah, please. Let me tell you, completely untrue, a hundred percent untrue. Um, Without getting it, since he's not here to defend himself, so I'm not going to get too deep into it. But uh, basically, he had some sort of financial issues, okay? And therefore, every week, he would bring, he would meet me up in Memphis. He lived in Tate County, Mississippi. Right. And which is further south than DeSoto County, Mississippi, where I'm from, where I live. Uh, and my bank account was in Memphis. Kamala didn't have a bank account. Every week on payday, he would meet me at up in East Memphis at the bank where I did banking at the time with his check, signed it over to me. And, of course, the people at the bank knew who I was, and they knew I wasn't stealing somebody's check. So I would cash his check every week, and I'd come out to the car and give him his, his money. And uh, let me tell you, without getting into specifics, and deservedly so, he was the one in the ring. He was making a hell of a lot more than I was, a hell of a lot. And I was making decent. Um and for him to say that he wasn't making any money, it's completely 100% untrue. He was being paid very well. And I, if I would have photocopied or one of those pay stubs, I can show it, you know. But he, I, for some reason, he decided to make up that they weren't p paying him. I mean, he went on one, uh, I don't know if it was a podcast or a website, what it was, told everybody that he couldn't afford a, a hotel room. Mm. And, it, me, and me and him and Steve Lombardi always traveled together. And Kamala told it on some form, I can't remember what it was, it said that me and Steve stayed in a hotel room and Kamala had to sleep in the car because he couldn't afford to pay a hotel room and we wouldn't let him stay with us. I mean, that's ridiculous. So, no, those, uh, you know, somebody said, was there any funny stories? No, but that was, I mean, that was just so untrue, blatantly. Not even a, this much true to any of that, to none of it. And as far as, what Undertaker or whoever was paid, I don't know. It's not my business. Right. Okay. Uh, now, just being a, a sensible person that's been in the business for many years, was Undertaker paid more than uh, Kamala for being in the same match? More than likely. I don't know that for a fact, and I, could, I couldn't testify to that. More than likely, he was the one that was the Hulk Hogan at the time. He was the one that was the John Cena at the time, or the, whoever you want to name. Um, so naturally, the, the main guy is going to make more than the guy that's there to, to uh, work with him. I mean, that's just how it works. That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Did he ever tell you the Andre the Giant story when he put a gun in his uh He used to trunks? say that, but like I said, I wasn't there knowing that he made up about his finances and all that, his checks or whatnot. I'm not saying it was true or not true, the Andre right, story. I right. wasn't there, so I can't say. So. Maybe it was true, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. You mentioned Sid a few times. Tell me about the person, Sid, one as a human being and then the other as a wrestler. Well, Sid's a great guy. Um, we, we go way back. Um, in fact, I got him his first full-time job in the wrestling business um, in 80, I think it was 1986. I ain't sure. I can't remember. 85, I don't know. Uh, the, Robert Fuller was booking Continental, which was the Alabama uh, territory. And he wanted to do the Lord Humongous gimmick with the hockey mask and the leather straps and all that. And he asked me if I knew anybody that would look the part. He says, you don't have to be a, you know, Luthez in the ring or Shawn Michaels now or whatever. You know, just he's just going to be a big, you know, guy that looks the part. Well, I knew Sid would, would uh, 
would absolutely fit the part, you know. So uh, I contacted Sid. We went to Alabama. Robert uh, hired him as Lord Yamongas. I was his manager, and uh, that's how he got started. And he was, you know, I, and Sid himself would probably tell you he was very green at the time. He was brand new to the business, but uh, he learned to work because he worked with Danny Davis every night. Not the WWE Danny Davis, but Nightmare Danny right. Davis, mm-hmm. but, um, who was a great worker, a small guy, but muscular, good worker. He worked with him a lot. He worked with Bob Armstrong, who was a tremendous worker. Um, worked with Wendell Cooley, who was a good worker, and different, you know, guys. So that's where Sid learned how to work. And uh, uh, Eddie Gilbert came in later as the booker. And when Eddie left to go to, I don't remember if it was WCW or the Crockett's. I don't know because I didn't go. But he took Sid, and that's the first time he took him out of the mask and made him, you know, Sid had that good, Mean looking face, and, right. you know, rugged uh, face, tremendous body. So Sid was a prototypical like if you wanted to build a wrestler, that that was the guy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt there, no doubt, no argument. So, uh, very good friend of mine, and like I said, he was instrumental in helping me get my foot in the door with uh, WWE, and I'll never forget that. You know, he, he when they asked him about me, he certainly put me on a pedestal. So, um, great guy. We're very good friends. Um, to this day, we haven't spoken in about a couple months, um, but that doesn't mean we're not friends. It just means we just hadn't spoken. Do you do you still talk to a bunch of your brothers uh, often? Or? I talk to Lawler all the time. I talk to him. How all the time. how is Jerry Lawler after everything that's gone on? Uh, how's he doing? How's the recovery coming? You know, he seems like he's doing a hell of a lot better. He's uh, actually going to make his first uh, appearance on, on a. Con or whatever you call those get-togethers convention, he's going to be at that WrestleCade in North Carolina, November something. I wish I could plug it, but I don't remember the date. November right. something. Um, uh, from what I understand, he's not going to do any signing. I guess his his uh, motor skills with it are still a little bit uh, not up to the par he would like them to be. But he's just going to do pictures, posing for pictures. Uh, we talked, like I said last night. His uh, he's getting it sounds a lot better every time I talk to him. His mind is fine. He didn't lose any of his cognitive right. uh, skills. Or and anything. his speech is better. Better. It's mm-hmm. not 100% yet, uh, but it's a lot better. Uh, what it is, basically, he might know what he's going to want to say, and you can tell he knows it, but he just can't 100% articulate it, if you know what I mean. Right. So, I mean, we all do that sometimes. Like, I might be, you might ask me where I ate lunch today. Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah, right. But then I was, oh, yeah, I can picture the play, you know, whatever. Yeah, sure. And I think that's what he's going through now, I, I think. So, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm a big television guy, and I love the Young Rock. And I'll be honest with you, all the stories they were telling, I had no idea that you had that involvement with the Rock. First, I want to talk to you about your relationship with Rocky's father, the great Rocky Johnson. Can you tell me anything about that? Oh, my God, yeah. He was like a second father to me, but the one that let me drink and smoke and do whatever I wanted, you know. But uh, what happened was, like I said, I'm the world's worst of years, maybe 85, 84, 83. I don't, hell, I don't know. But years and years ago, I was working for Bob Geigel in Kansas City, the old original NWA, Central States Territory it was called at the time. And uh, Rocky was there. And that's when I was just getting my feet started trying to manage. Um, so Bob Goggle would just have me in a suit and sit in a chair in the corner and don't do anything. And if it was time for me to do something, get up and do it, go sit back down or whatever, you know. And Rocky knew I could do a hell of a lot better than that. You know, I, I was active. I could run around the ring. But Bob Goggle was like, you know, the old school. I mean, God bless Bob Goggle. I loved him. God rest his soul. That just, he was old school. I mean, if he was still alive today, he'd probably be 100 years old, you know. So right. um, he didn't go for the entertainment type thing. Well, Rocky knew that was where I should be, you know, what I should be doing. So he goes, why don't you come to Hawaii and work for the uh, my Vias? I'm helping doing the booking over there, and we'll let you manage uh, over there. Well, that's when I went, me and Rocky became very tight. I was over there managing and running around and doing all my, you know, stuff and getting over because I mean, I ain't gonna brag, but I was pretty damn good when I was young. I, you know, that's not really bragging. It's me just being confident in my own abilities. I was getting over. Um, Lawler came over to Hawaii in, in whatever year it was, and asked Rocky if I could manage him that night in the event. Lawler loved 
the way I managed him because Lawler was the bad guy, the heel mm-hmm. over there. So uh, one thing led to another, and that's how I wound up getting my break in Memphis. So, uh, you know, I went from Hawaii to Memphis. Mm-hmm. So Rocky was instrumental in, uh, you know, how, you know how things just, you know, what's the old song, uh, Chain of Events, uh, cause and effect, chain of events, all the chaos makes perfect sense. And, you know, Rocky and Lawler, you know, it all came together because of Rocky bringing me to Honolulu from Kansas City. So that's how that began. And then, uh, of course, Dewey, Dwayne, the rock, the great one, Rocky's son, of course, everybody knows. There's no spoiler alert there, you know. And uh, uh, not long after that, Rocky came to Memphis Territory. With Dewey, his son. And a lot of that is uh, portrayed in the show, Young Rock. But Is that realistic, the way they portrayed it, or is it kind of just it's, like well, no, freedom? It's, it's realistic, but they added comedy and, you know, things that didn't actually happen. Right. But in theory, it's all realistic. Just, what's the word, embellished or exaggerated or whatever. But, yeah, Rocky asked me, could uh, Dewey live with me? And I said, yeah, Rocky went off and did his thing, and Dewey and me, I mean, I'm like 19, and he's like 12 or whatever it was, you know, so what a hell of a father figure I was, you know, or he was 14. Clearly, clearly a pretty good one, considering how the guy turned out, Turned right? out, yeah. yeah. So, not but, too bad, not too shabby. Yeah, so we, that's how me and him got close, and once again, all these chain of events. So, I'm, I'm, I told you, shows goes into more in-depth stuff, so I, this is kind of a tough question for okay. you. you. You said it yourself. You, you got pushed into his father figure role, and you obviously you did a fantastic job. Had many guys in here that had relationships with Rocky Johnson, and even the show kind of shows that Rocky seemed to be very aloof and in a lot of points seemed not to be caring towards his wife and the family. Uh, and to be honest with you, like cheating on his wife on a consistent basis, right? And... I'm sure Rocky or Dewey knew this was happening. The young Rocky, how was that affecting him knowing that his father was doing this to his mother? Well, to be quite honest with you, uh, back in when he was a teenager, staying with me, I don't know if he knew that was happening or not. He just knew that Rocky was off doing his own thing. I'm, I don't think Dewey, I mean, uh, Rocky Sr., you know, Rocky Johnson, was letting his son know that and I certainly didn't feel like it was my place to you know sure so no honestly I I, I don't think that was an issue that just him being absentee a lot I think but, but you could I'm just saying you could see on the show he loves his father but you could see the way it's written that he makes sure that as an audience member you knew that his father was not doing right by his yeah mother. I think that th- that that that's part of the realism of it they were showing it it wasn't this might outdate me, but you know, it wasn't the Ozzy and Harriet family or the, you know, the, the, what I, you know what I mean? One of those shows where everybody, Beaver Cleaver family. Yeah, it wasn't obviously, but the show itself, as you asked a minute ago, going around the back around to what you asked, was it realistic in a lot of ways? I never, everybody asked me, did you used to really cook eggs in the toilet? No, I didn't do that. <laughs> so that's something that's funny, but we were living in a little, uh, you know, "Quote unquote, uh, old shack by the railroad track. It wasn't really. It was a, just a cheap motel, but uh, it was all I could afford at the time. You know, but I didn't cook eggs on a toilet. But we were living in a little cracker box. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, sure. And a lot of those different things. Like I, I bought Dewey his first car, but in the show, I guess timeline wise, they showed him and some guy at a pizza place in Pennsylvania bought his first car. Well, it was in Tennessee, Nashville, downtown Nashville, and Lower Broad." We got him his first car, but they changed that for whatever reason. I don't care. I mean, I didn't get it, but I mean, I was okay with it. All right. Um, but yeah, the show itself was, uh, like I said, there was a lot of uh, embellishments, but other than the car purchase thing, most of it, at least the parts that I was involved in, were accurate but embellished. That'd be the best way to put it. Now, was he a troubled, like, they also portray him as a troubled teen, and now here you are in his father role. How, what kind of pressure was that on you? <laughs> well, let me put it like this. I was barely out of my teens at the time, right. too. And and this ain't like I'm 
talking on Dwayne, he would tell you this himself. He even had him put it in the Young Rock show. Hell, he would go out and shoplift stuff, and, and he'd come in and say, uh, oh, yeah, the guy at the store uh, knew who I was because uh, of my dad. So, um, you know, he gave me this uh, shirt, or he gave me this camera, or he gave me this. I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. I says, okay. I says, well, next, you know, back then I used to smoke cigarettes. I don't now, but yeah. I said, okay, well, next time you go to the store, see if the guy will give you a carton of uh, whatever I was smoking at the time. It, you know, and then it's, oh, see, <laughs> I'll give you a, a, a case of beer, you know. Right, right. And, you know, of course, I was like, Jesus Christ, I know what you're doing. <laughs> right, right. So I wasn't much of a, you know. You were you were enabling, right? Yes, but we grew out of that, of course. Right, that's great. Oh, my God. <laughs> So how's your relationship with him now? Do you Fantastic. still have, do you I mean, still have a relationship? Yeah. Matter of fact, my phone kept texting. I don't like to, to uh, I'm going to see it, make sure it wasn't him. That would be very interesting if it was. Um, <laughs> no, it wasn't. But, yeah, he texts me uh, on a regular basis and sends me voice mails, voice texts, whatever you call it, voice memos. And uh, we stay in touch. Yeah, we're very close. It's like He's one of the five people in this world I would die for, and I really mean that. On the Dan and Benny show, you tell a story about uh, him getting you a truck, right? And I've, yeah. I really love that story. So for fans that didn't hear it on that show and tune into this show, could you tell that story again? Yeah, and also just the people can see this, the story I'm telling. Yes. Just, just Google it on YouTube or whatever. How you, whatever. You know, I'm not technical. But, All over. You got it. Yeah. But um, basically, uh, Young Rock uh, season, I believe it was season two. It might have been season one. I can't remember was being filmed in Atlanta, which is only like six hours from Memphis, give or take, where I live. So they said that they're going to put me on a little uh, cameo uh, on the show. It had to be season one because Ryan, the actor that plays me, wasn't even in the picture yet. Downtown Bruno right. wasn't in the picture yet. It was still when he was a child or whatever. So they, they had me be an audience member, like the grown-up Dwayne, was running for president or whatever, you know, if you've watched the show. And they had, like, an audience, like, hollering out things to him or whatever. So they just had me, like, an inside joke. I'm in the audience. Hey, you, or whatever I said. I don't even remember what I said. So, uh, anyway, I, that's what I was down there for. And truthfully, for, for me to get a little payday, he was throwing me a bone. That's great. So uh, I got there the day before for wardrobe fitting or whatnot. And now you guys were filming in Australia, though, right? No, I, that was that was season two when the pandemic. Gotcha. Came. Okay, got I didn't go. Yeah, all right. I did all mine on Zoom. Okay, <laughs> you zoomed it, huh? Oh yeah. <laughs> but season one, uh, they just brought me down to Atlanta. So then uh, Dwayne says, uh, "We're gonna have them, you know, interview you and me together as a reunion." I hadn't seen him in like seven years or something at that time. So we were talking. He goes, "Tell the story when you you and me got together and you got me my first car." We're talking. And the guy's filming it with the, you know, camera. And about that time, this truck comes driving in right into the thing. And I'm thinking, oh, God, we're going to do this all over again. I just thought it was some random right. person drove the truck into the shot. And he goes, well, he goes, you bought me my first car, so now I've got the opportunity to repay you by telling you this is your brand new truck. Mm. I almost fell on the floor. I mean, I, I mean, I literally cried. Sure. Bought me a brand new truck, gave it to me, lock, stock, and barrel. And, uh. I said, oh, what do I do now? Do I drive it home? He goes, no, we're going to have to put it on a flatbed truck and bring it to Mississippi. And uh, they, they brought it on a flatbed truck, and I went and got the, you know, tags, put in Mississippi tags, took it out of his name and whatnot. And, yeah, that was a wonderful thing. I didn't expect it. I didn't, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's just one of the most wonderful things, if not the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me, you know. Well, it, it, it's good that someone... Again, we could go back to, as you know, again, you're saying you were practically his age anyway, but you, you, you influenced his life and you made him a better person, and it's great to see someone repay someone back at, in some sort of fashion, right? right? So pretty good story. Yeah, I love it, that story, yeah. man. He's just a great and wonderful person. He's, he really is. He's a fantastic person. Um, he, he hasn't went Hollywood. I mean, literally. Yes, he's in Hollywood. Okay, don't type away. I mean, <laughs> but you know what? He has a, He's still the same guy that I knew. I mean, obviously, he's financially in, uh, on Novocaine. You know what I mean? And sure. And, and he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> but, I mean, as far as the person he is, he's the same guy just with, with better uh, uh, items to accompany with. Him, you know what I mean? When you were in Hawaii working for the Maivia family, what, what was that family like to work for? 
Well, uh, it's funny. That's when I first met Atta, uh, Dewey's mother. Mm. She was a godsend to me. We're very close to this day. Um, she was an angel to me. Leah was hard. Like on The Young Rock, they show how Leah, right, that's yeah. pretty much how she was. You know, um, I was the bad guy, heel manager. And I did an interview one day. Oh, you Samoans are no good. You need somebody like me to tell you what to do because you're too stupid. I heard her tell Lars Anderson, we got to get rid of that guy. He hates Samoans. What, why, do we, why is he even here if he hates us? It's like, <laughs> I'm the bad guy. What am I supposed to do? I love you, Samoa. You know? yeah, right. For some reason, that really set her off. And to this day, I, I bring that up. You know, But Atta, God bless her. She was wonderful. Okay, wonderful. And she was my influence. Because I worked in the office all day. You know, we weren't working arenas every night. Because, you know, it's a small, you know, island area. We didn't have matches every night. Maybe a th- couple or three times a week, maybe, at the most. So I might worked in the office all during the day under Leah. And it was hard because she was, she would just, she was not the easiest person to work for. But, I mean, God bless her. You know, at the end, that's just how she was. But, you know, it's, it's does my heart good to know that Otto was there for me to, to be the buffer. That obviously Dwayne knows how she was, too, because look how they, she was portrayed. They didn't portray her on Young Rock like she was this wonderful angel. They show she was a, a hard-nosed type taskmaster. So, you know, it, uh, it is what it is, as they say. How was Lars Anderson? Was he as much as a prick as they portrayed him to be? He could be, but never to me. I always got along with him. I, in fact, I, me and him... Kevin Sullivan and uh, Rocky Iakea did uh, Tales of the Territories out in Los Angeles yeah, yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. That's the first time I'd seen Lars in like probably 38 years or something like that. We got along. He's a hard-nosed guy. But, you know, another thing, too, he's, and don't let anybody get mad at me for saying this. This is the truth. He's a Minnesota guy. And they're not outgoing like us Mississippi guys or y'all New Yorkers. Right. They're more, you they're know. More, they're more Ole Anderson. Right. Yeah. So he's. Sometimes they might take his stoic personality as prickness, which I don't think it is. He could be hard to get along with at times, but uh, I actually stayed with him when I was in Hawaii at his condo. Had my own bedroom and everything, and uh, I got along good with him. I, I personally have no issues with him. I did see some of those issues with others, but not with me. Mm. And as far as the thing on the tales of the territories when him and Leah got in trouble or whatever, and the, they got beat up, or he got beat up, I wasn't there. I was already gone. Right. So I, I, they asked me about it then. I, I, I can't comment. I wasn't there, you know. So you start wrestle, you know, you start in the wrestling business at a really young age, right? Yes. Um, being that you were in that business, did it affect you in your personal life that you could not adapt personally, like, to regular folk? I guess in a, in a way, yeah, because back then we protected the business to the point of, you know, I couldn't do this, you know. Yeah, sure. Right. And, and, sure. Yeah. I guess I didn't, and we, we were very uh, circle the wagons type thing back then. We mostly associated with other people in our profession. Uh, but, I mean, you mentioned you were married twice, right? Yeah. I mean, we all go through marriages or whatever right. else. That was that way after. Way after when you retired, you got remarried? You got married? Well, no, I should say it was way after when I first broke in. I should no, say. I get it, yeah, but yeah. you're still in the biz. Right. Now you're with your wife. You've been in the biz a long time. It's the only thing you really know, right? You meet someone, you get married. Is it like, yeah, geez, I'm not kind of into this marriage thing. I'm used to being on the road. I'm used <laughs> well, actually, to doing no, this. Or... To be honest with you, that had nothing to do with either one of my marriages not working. My second wife, God bless her, she's had some health issues, and, you know, that's, you know, God bless her. We still talk. Good. My first wife, honestly, I don't even know whatever happened to her. I mean, we used to stay in touch somewhat, but that was a the first uh, breakup. Well, that was a hard one, you know. It's just it. We were both too young. I was in my twenties; she was like nineteen, you know. So that was a that was a hard one. The, 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 this other one was harder too, but in a different way, you know what I mean? But no, neither one of it had to do with the business. It was just, you know, things you know just internal. didn't work out. Yes, exactly. Do you? Do you feel like um, if you could do it all over, like start over again, would you have chosen this profession? Oh, absolutely, because I'm, I'm far from rich, but I, my house is paid for. I've been all over the world. I'm sitting here talking to you, and I'm not saying it to, you know, be funny. I'm serious, like things yeah, like this. I understand. If I was digging ditches or something, or even if I went to work for the railroad or something and was getting a pension, I wouldn't have what I do have. 
I wouldn't have had the friends I've made. Uh, I wouldn't have had the experiences I've had. The only thing I would do different, looking back, if I could go back in time, I don't smoke cigarettes, but I smoked cigarettes back then. That's probably has something to do with my voice being like this. I haven't smoked a cigarette in 30 years. But Good man. I, I would have never smoked a cigarette. I wouldn't have, and I'm very open with this. I, I got two DUIs back in the 80s. That cost me quite a bit of money. And I could have killed myself or somebody else. Sure. Thank God I didn't. Yeah. Never drink and drive. I wouldn't drink and drive again for nothing. But I would have not done that. You know, there's, you know, of course, we've all got things. Everybody's got something. Yes. And I would have a lot more money if I didn't have those DUIs and the marriages and the issues. But I've more than made up for the money I've lost, you know, and I've, I've, I've taken care of my money well. Like I said, my house is paid for. Um, I made some mistakes. I would, just, I would still stay in the business, but there are certain things I would do and certain things that I did that I wouldn't. I'd go back and undo. But you know what? It's like Willie Nelson says, there's nothing, nothing I can do about it now. So just onward and upward. Just don't make the same mistakes twice. How do you like today's wrestling against the wrestling you grew up with? Um, what, well, are you, what are your thoughts about that? Well, naturally, the wrestling I grew up in, in is in my heart. But I also know today's wrestling, these guys are just much better athletes, much better performers, much better everything than, than I'm not saying everybody. I'm not knocking people. Right. Let's just say not better, but just different. We weren't – in our day, it was different, Okay. It's just, it's almost like comparing apples and oranges. You know, it's, it's a whole well, different thing. Let, let, let me rephrase it then. How about yeah. this? So, right, back in the day, more punch kick, arm bar. Now it's a few more high spots or more athletic wrestling, probably for yeah. a better term. It's just a different, different. Would, uh, would you, on the other end, would you say the mic work is better then or now? I would say the mic work is better in our day. And that maybe, that's, maybe that's just me because that was my day, but we didn't have people telling us what to say back then, okay? Which, here's the thing. These guys now didn't have the luxury that guys like me had to be in a territory and work every night, you know, and learn from different people and learn different styles and learn different whatever. We, by the time me and a lot of us guys in my day got to the WWE, we'd already been in the business for years and worked umpteen different territories. These guys don't have that luxury. Yeah, some of us struggled some. There were some territories like Kansas City we didn't make a lot of money. And sometimes when I was in Louisiana, didn't make a lot of money. Had fun, learned a lot. Uh, now these guys come straight out of wrestling school. Or maybe not even wrestling school. Maybe straight out of some other form of ath athleticism or whatever and go to the uh, developmental yeah, in sure. Florida or whatever. Yeah. So they have to be taught how to, okay, remember this? thing to say on TV. We didn't have that. With me, it'd be like, uh, okay, Bruno, you're uh, wrestling Monty uh, tomorrow night. Uh, make sure you remind the people that this is a no-holds-bars match. Okay, right. get out there. you got three minutes. Right. And, you know, now it'd be like, Monty, you are no good. And <laughs> I will get you. You know, I couldn't do that. I love it. Yeah, if I had to do it now, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Right. Just, I, you know, just give me the bullet points, tell me what not to say. And, uh, you know, and we had another thing, too, in our day. We had a lot of the, like, Dusty Rhodes, Superstar Billy Graham, my, uh, and so, even some of the lesser-known guys that was in Memphis with me, you know, could do the, the, the jive talking. They don't really do that anymore. You know, like, you know, uh, I'll tell you something. Right here, right now, downtown good-looking Bruno, 185 pounds of walking, talking, roping, stomping, downtown destruction, downtown born and downtown bred. And when I die, I'll be downtown dead it's like mama says it bees that way sometime live with it you know nice, this nice. is bam just like that very good that's yeah. incredible well thank holy you. cow <laughs> wow you know what i am the man that walked that barbed wire fence barefooted been bad been good dallas vegas and hollywood got a 45 pistol on a 38 frame boom you know just whatever i guess <laughs> unbelievable what wrestler got you into wrestling uh, making a living got me into wrestling. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So it wasn't like one, you saw one guy and you're like, oh, I want to get involved in that. And no, I was, I was uh, offered an opportunity to travel with Mid-Continental Wrestling, Dale Mann, uh, out of West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, whatever. Uh, I think, is it East? No, Western Pennsylvania, I believe it was. Um, I was given the opportunity to, to go on the ring crew. 
That's how it all started. And then I got to learn in the business as I went along, and I, and I said, well, I'd like to do that. You know, and I just kept doing it ever right. since. Um, so, yeah, it was nobody. Now, uh, bef- I wouldn't say as a fan, but as a new guy to the business, I was certain guys that I really liked to watch and that were really impressive to me in every way. Jerry the King Lawler, of course. Dusty Rhodes, I think, was great. Dick Murdoch, who I was good friends with later on down the uh, line. Um, one guy I never got to work with, but I thought was incredible, was uh, the magnificent Don Morocco. Oh, yeah. To me, he was right up there with Lawler and him. I mean, Morocco's tremendous. You know, mm. I loved watching him. But that's when I was getting getting started in the business. I like I liked to to uh, watch different guys and learn from them. I mean, I know I was never going to be a intercontinental champion like Don Morocco, but I, I liked his, you know, procedures in the ring. I liked his talking, you know. So he was him, Lawler, Dusty Rhodes, Dick Murdoch I liked, you know. Uh, a lot of guys I liked watching. A lot of guys, a lot of y'all wouldn't have probably heard of, just Memphis guys. But, you know, I learned a lot from a lot of guys in Memphis too. So you've been around the game a long time. You've seen a lot of stuff. What would you say was the saddest day you ever experienced in pro wrestling? July 4th, 1994, when I was in the wreck, maybe, what, an hour, hour and a half from here with Joey Morella, Gorilla Monsoon's son. Um, without a doubt, nothing even comes in second place. I mean, the boy, and I say boy, he was only 31 at the time. The boy died in my, practically in my arms, you know, in the, in the uh, Nothing comes close to that, you know. I mean, coming back from Ocean City, Maryland, heading to Newark, he was driving. I was asleep. Unfortunately, so was he. Mm. And uh, he, I've got the accident report in my safety deposit box at home in, in uh, Mississippi. Basically, just blunt force trauma to the head, you know. He was just, he was gone right there. He didn't suffer, at least. Thank God. Um, did you end up having a conversation with Gorilla Monsoon? And yeah. what was that like? Well, I'll tell you. He, uh, we talked on the phone. And he said, you know, I don't blame you in any way. He goes, those things happen. You know, and I'll see you back at, you know. I didn't even miss it. I didn't even miss one day of work. We were That was July 4th. We were off for like four or five days after that. And always, I mean, not because of the wreck. I started back the very next week in uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Wow. Didn't miss a day of work. Wow. And uh, that's back when Gino, you know, Gorilla was the on-screen, I think, president of WWE or commissioner or something. Yeah, So, and I was, you know, Harvey Whippleman, the bad guy manager. So, I seen Gino. We hugged and everything. Then we had to do an interaction thing where he would say, well, Harvey, blah, blah, blah. So, I was doing my part. And this is what really broke the ice. When I said, let me tell you something you know good, blah, blah, blah. He goes, well, let me tell you something, you little pipsqueak. You know what I mean? It broke the ice. And we was like, business as usual. Back to life. Yeah, back to life. It, to me, that's amazing. You know that, right? It's like yeah. I, you know, but both of you guys, I don't know how you could recover so, so fast. I was blessed by the Lord. I'm a very strong Catholic Christian, so I believe strongly in that. Um, um I mean, thank God, I wish Joey would have lived, of course. But, I mean, if God was ready to, like, I have the letter at home that Gino wrote me. Um, I don't think his wife wrote it, but I think it was Gino's work. Can, can you share a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. He, sure. he said, apparently God needed a, a right-hander and not a manager at this time. Right-hander, you know, referee. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So that that was, you know, it meant a lot to me. Um, I mean, that does say a lot about Monsoon, right? That he just lost his son, but he's also worried about you and how it's affecting you. And he right. felt it necessary to to write you about yes. that. Yeah, it meant a lot to me because, I mean, it was nobody's fault. I don't know what happened to cause that to, for Joey. So, I mean, it was just, it was traumatic. You know, I mean, how else can you put it? It was just, but I had to keep moving, you know. And it was like I was in a hospital there in, in uh, Morristown, North, North uh, Jersey. And, you know, there was no cell phones or nothing back in. And I don't know how bad he was mutilated or, or, or sure. whatever. I don't know. Here's the thing. I wouldn't know you from the President of the United States without my glasses. Okay, right. I'm very 
near and far sighted. I've got no line bifocal. I can't see without my glasses, period. Well, God saw fit to take my glasses off of me in the yeah. wreck. They flew off my head or whatever. Obviously, it was, you know, traumatic accident. So I didn't get to see, thankfully, Joey. You know, I can't see. There's no cell phones. I always have an extra pair of glasses in my suitcase out in the car right now, you know, because if something happens to these, I'm screwed, right. you know. So, yeah, sure. so I'm rooting around trying to find my suitcase, and I can't find it. Evidently, it was thrown away from the vehicle. I can't see. I'll never forget this. I says, Joey, you're dead, ain't you? Mm. And he didn't answer. And it was a smell like I've never smelled before. It was obviously the smell of death, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I'm no expert on that or no pathologist, whatever the word, coroner, but it was a smell I never smelled before. It had to be the smell of death, I, I, you know. Not to be morbid, I'm just being truthful. I can't see anything. I can see light. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, it's not black, you know what I mean? I can see, I can take my glasses off. I can see, I can tell there's a person right. sitting there, you know, but I, I couldn't identify you, you know what I mean? So anyway, I can hear the traffic on the highway. And I can see the lights of the, you know, nobody can even see because we're so far down that ditch, that, that hill or whatever you want to call it. Nobody can know what's happening. So I crawled up. I can't see. I'm crawling towards the light. Uh, literally, not, you know, to heaven. You know what I'm saying? Towards the light. And I get up there. I'm waving my arms. Well, nobody can see that there was a car in the ditch or nothing. So they just thought, oh, this is some crackpot. I, I, you know what I mean? I would have thought the same thing. Um, long story short. Finally, this truck driver stopped and because he's seen where the guardrail was smashed. I guess he paid it. And I'll never forget it. This is almost uh, 30 years ago. His name was Tobias Schrock. I'll never forget it because, you know, his name was in the accident report and everything. I, God willing, I hope he's still living and thriving and doing well. And if he hears this, I ain't never forgot you for this. He got on his CB or whatever and called, you know, uh, Whoever he called, the authorities or whatever. Before you know it, it was lit up like the 4th of July there. There was ambulances, fire trucks, police, you name it. And they got me to the hospital. A little while later in the hospital, uh, they said, uh, is your name Bruno Lauer? Yes. We found your suitcase. Oh, thank God. I put my glasses on. Nobody would tell me. I kept asking, is, is, how about the other guy? How about the other guy? I was hoping somebody would say, he was knocked out, but he's okay. Whatever. But right. Finally, this one doctor came in and says, yeah, he didn't make it. And at least I, I wasn't happy to hear that. Right. Don't get me wrong, but I needed to know. You know, I was happy ain't the right word, but I just needed closure of one way or the other. I didn't want to be, is he laying as a vegetable? Is he, right. whatever. I just need to know. And uh, all I ever got out of the whole thing was a broken nose. And like two stitches in my hand. You can't even see it now. I guess I really studied. I could find it. But that was it. Yeah. I guess God. my nose God. hit the dashboard or something, you know. But And Joey lost his life, you know. So I, get, I almost lost mine for the business. So, you know, thank you, Jesus, you know. And God bless Joey. I hope he's having a great uh, reunion with uh, Gino in, in heaven. I know he's in heaven, and I know Gino is. So they're in a better place than us, you know. All right, man. I want to thank you for joining us. Incredible interview. Great job. Thank you so thank much. You. Uh, where can fans see you upcoming? Got anything upcoming? Uh, December the 2nd, I'm going to be at the uh, uh, Pop Culture Comic Con in Dyersburg, Tennessee at the uh, uh, Fanel Center in Dyersburg, Tennessee on Highway 50. No, the Lanham Center. I'm sorry. Dyersburg, Tennessee, December 2nd. I'll be there from noon to 4 p.m. And that night at the uh, Pro Wrestling Mid-South at the Herb Welch WrestlePlex, I'll be a special referee for Pro Wrestling Mid-South that night, uh, bell time, 7.30 p.m. That's my next uh, appearance. So they're both in Dyersburg. You can see me twice in one day. Uh, and uh, other than that, uh, you can uh, purchase downtown Bruno T-shirts on Pro Wrestling Tees. And uh, you can go on uh, – on, uh, uh, crowbarpress.com and get a copy of it's it's been out for over I think 10 15 years now but the, the, the book that just expands on what we've talked about today called wrestling with the truth by Bruno Lauer which is my real name and uh, 
you know, anybody that enjoyed this interview may enjoy that. So, well, I know, to... I know, I will. I'll be buying it. They're incredible stories, and I can't wait to learn more. And again, thank you for taking the time on thank to you, come man. on our show. And God bless you. God bless you. I want to thank you, everybody, for joining us on this Sunday. Abe, you made it. You're a star. Rough weekend. I'll see you on Thursday. You've been watching Long Island's number one pro wrestler broadcast. Have a great rest of your weekend.